the first thing that happened when you came to this club from a different club was that you we just made you feel welcome and that you you know that you'd you were part of the team straight away. My two uncles played, my brother played, and incidentally, two of my sisters played for, for uh, Spartans. Kids used to make fun of me because when the guys lost their premiership, I'd go home crying thinking I've lost it as well because it was my premiership as well, you know. I became a life member in 1975. A great thrill to be part of the club that way, you know. Yep. It's been a big part, yep, with Dad. Lou, my father, passed away in 1981. Um, and obviously there's a huge legacy of Dad with the Brian Waterer Lou Reed medal uh, in honour of both those gentlemen. It's an honour to have a, a medal named after Dad with all the work he did, absolutely. In a world that appears more isolated, where people spend more time on their smartphone rather than in the community, what is it that motivates a local cricket club in the suburbs of the most isolated capital city in the world to continue to grow and be a place where the community wants to be. It's the greatest club of the years. I just love playing cricket, cricket at, 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 this, at this club. We colloquially refer to the Oval out there as the uh, home of cricket. There was a need for rehabilitation of servicemen in, in most areas, and Fremantle was one particular area. The Reverend W.R. Hibbert, he was the pastor of the Church of Christ in Fremantle. In 1918, at some stage, he was standing on the wharf watching the wounded coming back from France, unloading off the ship, and he thought, well, we've, we've got to do something to get these men back to normal, so he started a sporting club. So back then, the objective was to allow for men and women returning from the World War the opportunity to integrate back into society in a normal way. Sport was probably the best thing they could do. Because the war finished in September, they were back here before Christmas. Cricket was the logical game. The club formally started playing in 1918. In their first decade, they played as part of the Churches Association, joining a collection of teams who, for the first time since the war, all played in an organised competition. The Reverend sent me a letter in 1975, I think, explaining why he called us Spartans. He was looking for a name that meant strength of purpose, courage, mateship, and he decided Spartans. So that's how it came to be. The 20 or so young men became known in the community as the Spartan Cricket Club, after the celebrated ancient Greek military society known for its superhuman toughness and endurance. They played their games on Fremantle Park, which is one of the oldest uh, cricket grounds in Fremantle. It still exists. And in those days, the surfaces of the games weren't very good. People expected low scores. Total team scores were under 100. The batting averages from the time showed the dominance of the bowlers. Only three batsmen had an average over 50, whereas the top seven bowlers all had an average of eight or under with three of them reaching 50 wickets for the season. When they got a bit more sophisticated with not only ground surfaces, but wicket surfaces, things were in favour of the batsmen. But one thing you'll notice, that the players are wearing black socks because the grounds were so dirty to play on, and nearly all sand and not much grass, uh, yet wore black socks because white socks were <laughs> impractical. In the 1922-23 season, the Spartans reached their second consecutive grand final rematching the Brighton Cricket Club, whom they lost the cup to in the previous season. This time by one solitary run on the back of a hat-trick and maiden in the final over. The club celebrated its first premiership under the captaincy of Reg Prince. Reg Prince, the captain, his great boast was when they won the premiership. The other mob wanted three runs to win and they had four wickets in hand. He thought, oh, we've lost it. Everybody had a bowl by the wicketkeeper, so he put the wicketkeeper on and he took four for one. <laughs> and they won the premiership by one run. The club's second premiership win was in the 1925-26 season against the Richmond Cricket Club. The Spartans, under the captaincy of Bob Kirk, 
whose all-round performance between the wars rank him amongst the finest players to have ever represented the club. In the old Churches Association, they had one of those each year. If you won the Premiership, you got that and you kept it. And that was that was hiding in a cupboard in the church hall for 50 years till I found it, or it was given to me. The Churches Association objective was to support young men in the community, mostly under 21. The growing Spartans needed a new challenge, a new competition to remain competitive. In 1929, they broke from the Churches Association. They joined the Fremantle and Districts Mercantile Cricket Association, an older and more established competition, where they remained until 1996. In those days, if you were minor premiers and you were beaten in the grand final, you could challenge. And we won the grand final in 19... 34, but uh, I think East or South Emantle had been the minor premier, so they challenged and beat us. So we were premiers for a week. <laughs> we won it, then we lost it. But uh, that, that was the, the highlight of free war. The 30s were renownedly turbulent off the field. By 1932, the effect of the Great Depression reached its peak in Australia. There were queues for labour and some of those people had to go into the country and work wherever they were allocated. Some of them didn't have any money and food was short so unless they were a little bit more affluent or had a reasonable job they probably had to give cricket away. But on the other hand a lot of players came from the country to the city looking for work and I gather Spartans picked up quite a few of those before the war. On May 9th Hitler invaded Holland and Belgium. World War II was without doubt the most significant threat the club had faced since its inception. Christmas 1942, the captains of all the clubs met on the park and decided that because of lack of players, they would discontinue the competition. And then the government stuck concrete blocks on the park to stop enemy paratroopers landing on it. So that took care of anywhere to play. last shot had barely been fired. The club members serving overseas had just returned home and many of the players were back on the field. The fact that the war finished in our springtime meant that when the servicemen came home it was cricket season. A couple of chaps from pre-war clubs got together and restarted Spartans, uh, Albert West and uh, Jack Knox Beaton. Towards the end of the 1940s, there was certainly a lull in activity at the club. The Fremantle District Cricket Association needed to reinvigorate the competition, and they did this by introducing two-day cricket. And that also allowed clubs to have a second side. This was probably the start of the next year in the Lambing Spartans, where they became more competitive, more successful, and that only took them into the 60s, where they won their next first-grade premiership. Following the war, the clubs were very nomadic. Each year you had to apply for your home ground. One year you could be at, on Fremantle Park, the next year you could be out at Dabalak Oval, and the next year you could be on the Richmond Raceway and so on and so on and so on. Around about the mid-70s, clubs started to become more district orientated and clubs like Hilton Park and Ishimantle and that sort of, that sort of had a bit of pull within their, um, their districts in terms of getting grounds and headquarters and so on. We were playing all over the place. We played at Gibson Park and yeah, all over the place. But then, yeah, as Brian said, we, we didn't actually have a permanent home ground. We had quite a struggle within Spartans, political struggle of a kind, uh, where I wanted to change the name to North Mantle Spartans to try and get North Mantle Oval as a permanent ground. The traditional Spartans people wouldn't have a bar of it. So we sort of wandered and wandered and wandered until we came out to Parry Avenue ground. I eventually convinced people that if we tacked on Bull Creek Spartans, we'd get a better deal with the council. So they offered us Parry Avenue and we altered the toilet block into a club room. 
I went to the council to try and get a second story put on the building. They said, well, before you do that, come out here and have a look at John Connell Oval. And this had sat here for two years, not used. So we thought, yes, that'll do us. And then we came here in 1986. I suspect that had we stayed a bit nomadic like we were, or sort of living out of a change room like we were even at Parry, that we probably wouldn't have made it to 100 years. It was the fact we came here, got established, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. When I joined in 75, 76, essentially we weren't all that uh, successful. We'd, we had won two A grade flags within the past six years, but it had taken a long time to get to that. We were renowned as a social club and that has always been the case. By the time it entered the 1980s, it, it really hadn't achieved as much as probably what it should have achieved. They decided to go the next level in terms of professionalism and by doing that, they appointed Peter McGilvray as the first permanent coach. And my understanding is that's the first club in the competition to be able to do that. And that certainly lifted the standards of the club. And it also taught the club just mediocrity wasn't acceptable. You know, it's three flags in the first seven years. And that culminated in the 1992-93 first grade premiership. And in my opinion, that set the scene for the next 30 years of becoming more professional. From 1991 onwards, we, we got to the stage where we expected to be in, in the finals and expected to win premierships. And then, yeah, in the mid-o, we had a purple patch where we won four in nine years. We've still got to win one back-to-back. -back. <laughs> it's been our nemesis, but it was, a, it was a culture change, early 90s, where we became competitive and we just, yeah, we just expected to be in the finals and winning flags. The last 15 years have been extremely successful for us, bagging four first-grade premierships and possibly being uh, runner-up four or five times in that time as well. And, widely regarded as the benchmark club in the association these days. During the early 1990s at the Fremantle District Cricket Association was probably outgrowing itself and Leeming Spartans then were also growing in numbers of sides that it had and something needed to be done. And Brian Waterer, who was the president of Leeming Spartans at the time, but also president of the Fremantle District Cricket Association, he was the person that basically initiated change. It was quite a process changing from a mercantile club to a semi-district club that fractured a few friendships along the way. Instead of an amalgamation, the Fremantle District Cricket Association disbanded and they introduced the South Metropolitan Cricket Association in 1995 and that competition well, still yeah, exists yeah. today. Fremantle District Cricket Association had eight clubs. It's now expanded to 22 clubs and that, that allows for so many different clubs and people with different sides to be able to participate in the South Metropolitan Cricket Association. We've got lads playing here now in their 40s who started with us when they were 12. In the long run, it was worthwhile. By the turn of the century, the club had enjoyed their facilities at John Connell Reserve. However, the Spartans' rapid growth put strain on their ageing clubhouse, hence the requirement to further expand their home. It was the initiative of Brian Waterer and Graham Ashley who went to the Melville City Council to see what could be done to refurbish their facility. Unbeknownst to us, the bowling club went to the council at the same time and they wanted extra space. So then the council said, well, no, we're not building two new buildings. If you guys can get together, we will build one building to accommodate you all. Magnificent facilities, we're really lucky and I suppose that's one of the reasons that we're so successful today. The building, with its panoramic views of the ground, multiple club rooms, commercial grade kitchen and bar, was officially opened on the 5th of October 2003 by the Mayor of the City of Melville. On a Saturday night, we would actually pack it out. We'd have people outside on the veranda because they couldn't actually fit in the club. We had a band night here one night and it was just, it was just ginormous. It was just people absolutely everywhere. Now guys, I, I just want you to stop and think for a minute. Why are we here? The history of Spartans is deep and rich. And what sets it apart from all others is that when you are a Spartan, you are a Spartan for life.
to all of you committee people over the 100 years that are here tonight and the ones that aren't, I thank you. Well done. as a leading wicket taker at the club, but it's all about the club. I've been here 29 years, I've met a hell of a lot of people, made so many mates and lifetime mates, and I'm so proud to be a life member of this cricket club. It's a great night, and it's a night for the ladies as well. Um, a lot of the ladies have gone to a great effort to dress up. Perhaps the culmination tonight is the team of the century. There's Lou Reed, who's a legend. There's Harold Bell, an opening batsman. There's Greg Dudley, number three. What a great player he was. We've got Matthew Smith at number four. We've got Paul Hitch at number five. Our captain and our coach, Peter McGilvray at number six. At number seven, Paul Koleski. Mark Atkinson played for Western Australia. He's in the team. Paul Clement, all-rounder. Barry Ma. We've got George Plusky and 12th man, John Spencer. All 12 are either here tonight in person or represented by their family. It's just fantastic. We pride ourselves on being a people's club. So, we, you know, you do see a lot of the, the wives and families around the place. We, we have Spartan families, I suppose you'd call them, where they're three and four generations. Father, son, grandson have all played here. And we've had people here like uh, Malcolm Johnson. He, ne he never played a game of cricket. Just liked the place and liked the people and been helped out a lot. And we have had a couple of uh, intellectually handicapped people over the years that have come. Um, we've got a guy currently who's uh, been involved in interstate sport. People in the top positions in the cl this club in particular tend to last a long, long time. A lot of other clubs, they were changing presidents every year and secretaries every year and, and that sort of thing. But I think in the first 60 odd years, I was only about the fourth or fifth president, whereas most clubs had gone through anything up to 20 by that time. That sort of gave the club a lot of stability. As the Spartan name suggests, tenacity, purpose and mateship is what has brought this humble cricket club this far. Well, cricket's a sport with a lot of history and Fremantle in particular uh, carries a lot of that. There's a few clubs that have played at Fremantle Park. It's our home ground now. It was Leeming Spartan for a long time, CBC previously as well. Uh, so it's nice to share that history too. Um, the 100 years is an outstanding achievement and, and Big Net at our cricket club want to congratulate Leeming Spartan on uh, being so successful on and off the field for such a long time. The club's been through some pretty tough times and um, uh, have been some pretty tough characters have carried us through. Hopefully the rising generation at committee level will keep it going for another hundred years. The side was led by Chubba D'Angelo. Oh. Oh. The, the best uh, tin pin bowler in WA. <laughs> <laughs> but a really shit cricketer. <laughs> But certainly we have been open from day one. We will provide a game of cricket for anyone who wants to play. Uh, Derek Coldstream, unbelievable. First game for Spartans, he bowled one ball and broke down. <laughs> Whether it be as a player, socially, or just on and off the field, is irrelevant. It allows a place for people to come, be part of this great club, and who knows, in 100 years' time, there might be someone sitting in this chair talking about our bicentenary. Go 
me 120 kilos and trying to run around like an idiot. Did you take a few off? Yeah, I did. <laughs>